very thankful for the opportunity with my brothers and sisters here at C3 to be able to open the Word of God and uh, to talk about and preach the gospel here. If you're new here, don't worry. If you don't like the sermon this morning, come back. It'll be different next week. Tony will be back. That being said, let us pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word. Again, for salvation. Would you open up our hearts to the truth of your word? Father, we have no knowledge. We have no wisdom. We have nothing without you. Would you use the spirit in our heart this morning to illuminate the truths of your word to us? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The date was August 21, 1911. It's 7 a.m. and there's cleaners going through the, the Louvre Museum, which is in Paris. And all of a sudden, they look and they realize the Mona Lisa, most famous painting in the world, is gone. Even in 1911, the painting uh, in France w- would have been worth over a million and a half francs. Basically, you could Google it. It's a lot of money. And they joked about the situation because they thought, well, oh, it's missing. And they're like, well, but haha, it's it's probably just the photographers. No one actually thought someone stole it. In fact, it was two days before anyone realized that the painting was actually stolen. And the Mona Lisa was missing for almost two years before the thief finally tried to sell it, hence getting caught and leading to the recovery of the painting. And I say it because of this. In many ways, the Mona Lisa, the most famous, if you would, in some people's eyes, the most precious painting that we have was virtually forgotten for those two years because someone stole it. And in a similar vein, our understanding of the gospel and what the gospel means for believers is in danger of being stolen away of being hidden, of being buried, if you would, forgotten, even in our churches. And if you've been with us recently at C3, you know we've been using the scripture to examine popular sayings that, Chris, that you hear from Christians and examining their validity. And I think it's good for us to always open our Bibles and to examine all of our thoughts and our sayings through the word of God. And we've been taking our Bibles to examine and to test the accuracy, and as I was saying, the validity of these statements. And I know most of you don't know me. Um, you haven't heard me speak before. Uh, I, and I'm, I'm pretty, pretty simple, I think. My basic premise is using the Bible to, to process all of our thoughts, to process all of our thinking, to process all of our un- situations. Think of the Bible as a cheesecloth, if you don't know what that is, if you've ever cooked, right? I, I didn't, I wasn't aware it wasn't. I was sharing Tony the illustration. He said, what's a cheesecloth? I, I was like, oh, okay. So your wife probably knows. Um, I know what it is. I used to be a chef. So I, I was like, oh, you know, no cheesecloth. But like a colander, right? The thing you run noodles, the water through, you know, it holds the noodles. What? Okay. Yeah. That's like, that's what you would think of. A cheesecloth, something very fine. You'd press something through. Um, so we use the Bible as like a cheesecloth. We take everything that we think. We take everything that we're going through, and we press it through, if you would, the cheesecloth or through the word of God. Whatever remains, whatever the Bible holds, that is what we hold on to. If you would, the Bible or the word of God in that case would be like a pair of glasses that gives us clear vision. I'm also about the gospel. I would suggest to you that the Bible is all about Jesus. There was a time when Jesus is explaining what the Bible's about. And he says this, it's in Luke 24, 27. It says, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself. And it says in all the scriptures, because they were all written pointing to Jesus. And I say this because as we look at the things we say, when we look at the things that we think, my encouragement is to use our Bibles to process everything through the gospel, everything through the word of God. Just in case there's someone here who doesn't know what the gospel is, let me quickly explain. The Bible teaches that we're all sinners, which means we all have done wrong and we all equally deserve hell. Even as a Christian, on my best day, on your best day, without Jesus' work, 
We deserve hell. There's nothing good about us. The Bible also teaches that Jesus, who is God, came to earth to die for all those who turn away from a trust in self or self-righteousness and embrace that what we know of as the gospel, the good news. The gospel is the good news that Jesus died on the cross and that the wrath, the punishment, the hell, if you would, that I deserve, an eternal hell, Jesus paid for. And the Bible's answer to all of life's questions, I would suggest to you, is Jesus. The answer to our marriage problems, our life problems, our work problems, our health problems, or anything that we go through is Christ. It's Jesus. So today, as we validate this saying that Tony asked me to speak about, let's process the truth of the saying through what the Bible teaches us about Jesus and the gospel. So today, we're going to look at the saying that the safest place you can be is the center of God's will. And I don't know about you, but when I listen to that, the safest place you can be is the center of God's will, it makes me ask some questions, right? What does it mean to be safe? That's the first question I, came, I thought about. I'm like, well, I guess that depends what, what does safe mean. And secondly, what's the center of God's will? So let's open our Bibles this morning and answer the question, what is safety? And there's a long line of believers who led a very difficult and troubled lives in the Bible. Just, just to give you an example of some that we would look up to or have read about in the pages of Scripture, consider Job. This is a guy who loses, who had everything and absolutely loses everything because he was following the Lord. How about Joseph? Here's another guy who's imprisoned for doing the right thing and being faithful to God by not committing adultery, and he gets thrown into prison. How about Jeremiah? Probably one of the most faithful prophets we see in the Old Testament. This guy gets thrown into a hole, held at, literally thrown in a hole, held as a prisoner while being mocked by others suffering from depression. John the Baptist, according to Jesus, Jesus said the greatest ever born among, amongst women, the greatest ever born, this guy's beheaded. Paul, at times, had to comfort himself. And maybe you're familiar, he's with Silas. They're singing songs in a prison that's much worse than anything any of us can imagine. And they're down there singing all because he's following the Lord. Eventually, Paul's abandoned by all. He talks about that later, how all abandoned him. Believers abandoned him. They just, for whatever reason, and what was happening at the time, even his Christian friends. And he's held prisoner. And eventually, as far as we understand from history, uh, he is executed. Jesus himself, maybe you're familiar, is described as what? A man of sorrows and a man of pain. Yet, we often hear in today's Christianity, follow God, and he will reward you with what? Health, money, safety, here on earth. Because we've, we've, Christianity in today's time has converted the gospel into an equation to get a better life here, this side of heaven. So, once again, I would ask, let's put on our thinking caps and let's use our Bibles as we ask the question, what does it actually mean to be safe? If I've saved a lot of money and I have financial security, is that safety? By the way, I'm not saying any of these are bad things. I mean, the Bible talks about how we should take care of our family. and So these are not bad things, but I'm just asking. If I've saved a lot of money, is that safety? Does safety mean I'm not going to get in a car accident? Does safety mean bad things won't happen to me? Does safety mean I'm healthy? I'm not going to get sick. As long as I'm in the center of God's will, I, will, I won't get sick. And I know we have people in our church. We've been praying for them. We have some, some folks that are, are dealing with cancer. And I would ask the question, you know, can I be sick? 
Could I even be sick to the point that I, I would be facing the other side of eternity and death, yet can I still be safe? And I want to encourage those who are struggling. I want to encourage maybe those who are just in difficult situations. For believers, this broken and cursed earth, it's not our home. The scripture says that. If you are a believer, then your home is with the Lord and glory for all eternity. No pain, no death. And in fact, the Bible says God himself will wipe away every tear. Revelation 21 verse 3 through 5 says it this way. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mournings or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Funny, those little words in the Bible, like all, they're meaningful. God says, Behold, I will make, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. As we consider what the Bible has to say about being a believer and having safety, we have to ask the question, does the scripture teach we will suffer and and have things happen in our life that we perceive to be bad or unpleasant? And I would suggest, yes, sometimes it does. As believers, we're called to suffer this side of heaven. Not my words. I would prefer us all to be more comfortable. God doesn't usually ask me my opinion on these things. But 2 Timothy says this, remember, and this is Paul writing to his son in the faith, one one who he would consider most precious this side of heaven. Really, I mean, the relationship of Paul and and Timothy, if you're not familiar, it's, it's special. And Paul as a spiritual father is writing to his spiritual son who's serving in the ministry. And he says this, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. And Paul is stressing to Timothy the importance of enduring and encouraging him to have strength and to be willing to what? Be willing to suffer, right? To be willing to suffer for for the cause of Christ. And make no mistake about it, the New Testament clearly teaches if you know Christ and you follow the Lord, you will suffer persecution. It it happens. Again, I didn't write it, just the messenger. Luke 9, 23. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And just in case you didn't know, When Jesus says, and he talks about taking up the cross, that's not something that was pleasurable, right? Even Christ, when he's praying in the garden before the the day where he's literally going to be on the cross, what does he say? If it's possible, Father, let this pass. John 15, remember the word that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. And we need to anticipate difficult times and persecution. Hebrews 11, 35 and 36 reminds us, others were, and this is talking, you talk about the the hall of faith, if you're familiar with the context, but this is kind of towards the end of that section in Hebrews 11. And it says, talking about those who had come before, others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings. Yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. 
They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treatment. Men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. 2 Timothy 3.12, indeed all, so if you didn't get it yet, it's very plain. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Be persecuted. The Bible's true or it's not. It's true. This is why Jesus said in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Albert Brumley probably not familiar with who he is, though you might have heard some of his songs. He was a songwriter a long time ago, early 1900s. And he penned like something like eight or 900 songs. It's crazy. And he, he penned these lyrics. He said, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Remember this, we're not home yet. If you're a believer, we're not at home yet. Even the best stuff on earth is nothing compared to what awaits us. And it's better than that. Listen to Psalm 84 verses 10 through 12. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk up light rightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. If you are in Christ, then in eternity... God does not withhold any good thing from you because God is loving and he's good. And this is not exactly what the, sto- the end of the story is. We're not there yet. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then look at that, that clause in Ephesians 1.3. Who has blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And and Ephesians 1.3 is telling us that we have every spiritual blessing in heaven. I can't explain to you what every spiritual blessing in heaven is, but I know it's better than what we have here. And I know it's good. And I know it's exactly as God described it because I know who God is through his word. I know who he is because of Jesus's work that he's done in me. Heaven isn't as the fiction books and the movies do and have described it, right? We're on a cloud, there's some angel softly playing the harp, right? It's the old thing you'll hear from someone who's trying to sometimes mock Christianity, like, oh, well, heaven sounds boring. Heaven is not as this world has described it. Heaven is a place with eternal life, excitement, no sin or pain infinite riches from the hand of our infinite loving creator and savior. That's how the scripture speaks of it. The Bible is clear. This life is a passage to eternity. God is painting an amazing story of who he is. But know this, our home, our rest, our riches, and our comfort are on the other side of eternity in heaven with Jesus. The safest place is the center of God's will. And we just use the Bible to examine a bit of what God has to say about safety. Let's quickly consider, if you would, what is the center then of God's will? Let me be clear. The Bible teaches God is completely Sovereign. Sovereign means chief. It means highest. It means supreme or bet most in power, superior in position to all others. God is absolutely sovereign in control of everything. Play a game real quick. I know this was this is weird, but this is where normally you wouldn't speak when I'm preaching. But in this case, I'm going to ask you to speak. I'm going to say a word, 
and then I want you to give the opposite of the word. It's very easy, right? So if I said up, you would say, okay, if I said right, east, cold, God, Izzy, Izzy, I would suggest to you there is no opposite to God, right? There is no opposite. Satan is created. And I didn't say that to <laughs> embarrass or anything, but, but just to show sometimes where our mind gets kind of, you know, goes going. Or, but there is no opposite to God. Isaiah says this, so Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God doesn't just know the future. He hasn't just declared, he, he has actually declared everything according to the Bible. It's not that God's just hoping to win. Right? God's not over there just, just hoping it's going to work out, or, or he just looked into his crystal ball and saw that. That's not what this verse says. That's not what the scripture says. Some people think of God as like the greatest chess player, right? Meaning he always makes the right move and just he always knows how to, what to do and how to make a move. No, God says, My purposes will be established, and I, God talking about himself, will accomplish all my good pleasure. Isaiah 45, 23 says, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back. That is to, that it, that to me every now, every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. God's word is always accomplished. God's word is not accomplished because he can see the future. God's word is accomplished because he commands destiny. God's word is accomplished because he commands time and everything because he is sovereign. I say all this because it's important to understand when looking at the will of God that we see two aspects of God's will in scripture. And I think if you think about what I'm saying here, this will make sense. Now, these are human ways, right? The Bible is not, and let me just say this real quick, the Bible is not, and this might sound weird, but the Bible is not a theological textbook, right? Things that authors write and we write to break the Bible up into theology, those are what we do with it. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. The Bible is not written that way. The Bible are letters. The Bible is, is where it is history and songs. And, and it's written, as we saw earlier, pointing to Christ. We kind of take that and, and chop it up into what we understand of as our, norm, as our modern day theology. Now, and I say that because the way that I'm going to describe God's will is more based on how we read the Bible, we see these breakdowns. But the Bible doesn't come with, it doesn't have like this instruction book of, you know, here's how to theologically categorize God as if he could be categorized. God's will involves his ultimate complete control over everything. Uh, or his sovereign will. I'm sorry. Um, I missed the slide. It's not up there. Uh, <laughs> what we see in the scripture, I think, are two aspects of God's will. You see his sovereign will and you see his commanded will. So God's sovereign will involves his ultimate complete control over everything. Nothing happens that was not in God's plan. History is just the unfolding of God's purposes, which is which happens exactly as he planned it. Isaiah 14, the Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have planned, so shall it be. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. If you would, God's commanded will, and I said God's sovereign will before, God's commanded will is revealed through the Bible as principles and laws. It's the aspects of his will to which men are held accountable, right? That makes sense. I mean, there are things where God just says, this is what's going to happen. And then there are times where God says, I would, you know, people should do this. People should be this way, right? This is, this is what we're talking about. Commanded versus sovereign. Psalm 25 says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep, who keep his covenant and testimonies. Can God's will 
be ignored by us. Yeah, I would say so, right? Have you ever ignored God's will? You knew God wanted you to do something, yet you didn't do it? We all have a sin problem. Our flesh constantly ignores God's commanded will. The scripture has many examples of God's sovereign will and commanded will. And as we discuss what it means to be in the center of God's will, it's important to understand what God's will means according to the word of God. Spoiler alert, it's only Jesus who obeyed God's commanded will. We have all fallen short. It is through Jesus's work alone that you can be credited with his righteousness. This means all the disobedience that you've committed, violating God's commanded will, can be placed on Jesus, and all of his righteousness and obedience can be placed on you through the gospel. In summary, being in the center of God's will, I would suggest to you, is being born again because you have turned and placed your faith in Jesus alone for salvation, having nothing to do with you. While God is completely sovereign and in control of everything, you do see God's heart and you do see God's desire in the pages of scripture. And again, you talk about the center of God's will. Just consider some verses. How about Matthew 23? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often And you see God's desire here. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. God's desire for people is to turn to him. The only way to come to God, the Father, is through Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. 2 Peter 3.9 expresses a similar thought. It says, the Lord's not slow about his promise, talking about the end times, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And in short summary, if you want to be in the center of God's desire, come to Jesus. Romans 10, 13 says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, what does Jesus say? I will in no way cast out. God's will is for us to live a life with our eyes fixed on Jesus. Hebrews says that, right? With our eyes fixed on him. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything, give thanks for this is what? God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. God is in complete control. But we know that safety and security rest within the center of God's will, which is only found through the work of Jesus, the Christ. I just say this, Christ in case you didn't know, this, is, this isn't Jesus' last name. Um, it is a title, which means promised Savior, right? It's saying Jesus, the anointed one, the promised one, the one who was sent to save us and to save our souls. Jesus, the Christ. And if you're here today and you're not sure you're saved, find me after church or someone who, who you know knows the Lord and, can, and knows their Bible If you find me, I would be more than happy to show you what God says about how you can have guaranteed safety, freedom, and security for all eternity. Believers here today, maybe you fear not having financial security. Remember Ephesians 1.3. We have all riches awaiting us in eternity. Remember that, yes, While we need to take care of things and we need to do the right thing this side of heaven, true wealth lies in Jesus and in our home, which none of us have been to yet. It's in glory with Christ. Maybe you're here today 
maybe facing cancer, or maybe someone you know has severe health issues. Remember, this earth, not our home. Through Jesus, we have eternal life, as we read earlier, without pain. Fix your heart and your mind on what lies ahead in glory with Jesus. And maybe you fear, you know, Jay, maybe you'd say, Jay, that's me, by the way, if you don't know me. <laughs> maybe, maybe, you'd say, maybe you'd say, Jay, I don't know if I'm saved. Well, remember Jesus said that no one who comes is cast out. And again, I'd be happy to open up the word of God and sit down with you and encourage you. A very famous missionary, you've probably heard the saying before, very famous missionary named Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Let me say that again. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. A missionary who, if you're not familiar, died bringing the gospel to others. And his death opened the way of the gospel in the area he was. Hebrews 13 says this, For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name and do not neglect doing good and sharing. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. As we transition to communion, I want to encourage us as we seek to partake in, in the Lord's Supper together. And right before we do that, let's pray. And, and then um, we'll enter into time of communion. Father, we are thankful for salvation. We're thankful that we have a home and glory as your word. Jesus, as you said, that you, you go to prepare a place for us. And Father, we recognize that we're all unworthy. And yet you have given us everything. You, you, we, for those of us that know you, Father, you treat us based on complete obedience because of the work of Jesus. These are truths and love and grace and kindness that's beyond our ability to understand. Father, as others have said, if the whole ocean were ink and the entire sky paper, we would run out of room to write about your kindness to us and your mercy, and we would run out of ink to describe your love. We pray that if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that you would save them, that you would convict their hearts and help them to see their need of Christ. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.